Then these are the good questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll yeah, see. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs>
Um, and the gallery is situated in the new building, which is a building in the center of the VU campus. Uh, and in the new building, which is a multifunctional building, you can also um, watch uh, theater and movies, and there's also a gallery, so it's kind of the cultural hotspot of the VU campus. So actually, it's the, it's the nicest place to here. Um, and um, the program of this uh, VU Art Science Gallery is totally dedicated to the interaction of art and science. And by science, I don't, we don't mean uh, only the exact science, but all kind of research fields. We combine them with um, artworks from contemporary uh, artists. So two to three times a year, we invite uh, artists and scientists to share their research with us in this gallery uh, on a certain topic. And uh, so, for instance, this first exhibition, Zero, uh, starting from Zero, is all about, of course, the number zero. Um, and besides an exhibition, we also organize these uh, interactive events. Why do we do this? Uh, we do this as we believe that uh, art and science uh, complete each other. Uh, while uh, science is more about data and uh, is uh, art more about experiencing, and we think we need, all, we need to combine all kind of uh, knowledge um, to have a better understanding of ourselves. Uh, and also a multidisciplinary approach is really needed to face uh, all the current issues of our time. So we have to bring together all kind of knowledge and not only from the artists and scientists, but also from the audience. So we're really happy that uh, you join us today um, to share your insights with us. Um, and in our endeavors as uh, the gallery, we also work with partners. And for this uh, first edition, we have worked with several partners. Uh, for instance, we worked with um, uh, the art science uh, lab, Hybrid Forms, of Raoul Freese. He will talk about that later. Uh, and also with Clue Plus, which is an interfaculty uh, research institute of the VU. Um, and this is also part of a bigger project, which is called Studiotopia. And it's an uh, art science project which brings together all kinds of art and science col collaborations in Europe. Um, and also uh, for this uh, theme zero uh, and uh, the knowledge about that, we work together with the Zero Origin Foundation, which is an association which is dedicated to uh, investigation uh, investigation of the origin of the number zero. And last but not least, we also worked with Kunstlicht, which, which is an academic journal, uh, and they made an issue, especially uh, for this uh, show, uh, and it's called Shunya, starting from zero, and it's uh, it just came out and it's for sale, so you can check the website if you're interested in that. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the partners for this uh, great first edition. And I would also like to thank the, the speakers uh, who are here today. And I will introduce you to them, uh, them to you. <laughs> so uh, first we are going to listen to, to Maria Mikoli. Uh, she was the, of, is the assistant curator of this first uh, exhibition, uh, Zero Starting From Zero. Um, and uh, then uh, we will listen to Raoul Freese, he's the director of the Art Science Lab, Hybrid Forms, uh, and he will uh, introduce uh, to you the video project, which is also part of this edition. Um, and then we are going to watch and discuss uh, the four movies, and um, we are going to talk about uh, that with uh, some of the artists and scientists that are here. Uh, Nikki Asman, Jan Robert Leegte, Evelina Domnic and Dimitri Kelfan, uh, and the scientist Van Fokking, who was joining us online. He's the professor of theoretical computer science, and Florian Schreck, professor of experimental physics. Um, and this discussion will be moderated by Katja Kwastek, who is the professor of modern and contemporary art history here at the Vrije Universiteit. Um, and you can also participate uh, online by chat, and uh, the chat is going to be moderated by Sam Bannenberg. Um, and uh, last but not least, I just wanted to say we have a little break uh, at uh, a quarter to five until five. 
Um, and we will end around six. But first we go to uh, the part where Maria uh, will give you a tour through the exhibition. Uh, and I want to say that the exhibition that uh, can be seen until the end of February, because we have extended it uh, also due to the corona issues. Um, so let's going to watch, let's go and watch the video of Maria. Hello everyone and welcome to the exhibition starting from zero here at the Full Art Science Gallery. Um, this exhibition really focuses on the number zero which is extremely uh, complex and uh, multi-faced as a concept both mathematically wise and philosophically wise and for this reason we really wanted to investigate this number from multiple perspectives here into the exhibition. So I'm going to guide you through uh, our art space uh, and show you a few artworks but before that I would like to uh, ask you uh, have you ever paused for a second thinking about how much zero is uh, present in our lives? If you just think about the role that digital technologies has in mediating reality nowadays, for instance, or uh, the use that we uh, do of portable devices uh, to relate to reality itself, it goes without saying that, of course, zero has a predominant role in our um, everyday routine, but we really don't pay attention to it. We almost give it for granted uh, because it's such an elusive and intangible concept that it's really hard to, uh, to grasp and to pay attention to. Uh, therefore, um, we really wanted to uh, give the audience an idea of what this uh, concept of a philosophical and mathematical zero stands for especially uh, because uh, although we give it for granted today, uh, it took really a lot of time for Western European societies to include this number uh, into our numeral system. Um, indeed, historians uh, agree on claiming that uh, zero uh, mathematical, uh, as a mathematical number started to be used uh, around the 3rd, 4th century AD, particularly in India. Uh, and uh, early Indian mathematicians borrowed from metaphysics and from religion, such as the Rig Veda, the Sanskrit terms to denote zero. And among these terms, there are two particular terms that are really important to understand how this concept really is really uh, deep and uh, multifaced. And these two terms are specifically the term sunya, which stands for nothingness and void, and the term ananta, which stands for infinity. Uh, paying attention to these two terms, we can really uh, understand how how zero holds in itself this ontological duality as nothingness and infinity and as unity and multiplicity uh, that is, re is really fundamental uh, to understand better the, the exhibition concept itself. Um, although this uh, connection with this idea of infinity, actually Western European societies uh, really look at this number uh, skeptically. Uh, indeed, it took uh, a lot of time to uh, zero to get its way through us, uh, which happened around the 13th century uh, when Italian a mathematician Leonardo Fibonacci started to use and to include incorporating zero into his own research. But it took more than two other centuries for uh, this number to be widely used um, from, uh, from us and to, into our numeral system, which happened eventually around the 15th century. But still, during um, this time, of course, a lot of uh, things changed and developments were done and especially from the adoption uh, of zero into our numeral systems, uh, a lot of uh, scientific developments uh, happened. For instance, if we just think about all the developments in uh, scientific disciplines such as quantum physics or quantum mechanics or general relativity at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, it goes without saying that this number has been really fundamental uh, for uh, a lot of developments. But also uh, into modern language, the adoption of this way of saying such as starting from zero, as the title of the exhibition itself suggests, uh, it's a kind of a wish uh, for a new start. So this possibility of restart from this blank page uh, that is actually full of, uh, of possibilities. Therefore, uh, for this um, depth of the concept of zero, uh, we really wanted to give uh, to this exhibition uh, multiple entanglements. And uh, to do that, if you want to just follow me, So although uh, Western European societies really look at this uh, connection of zero uh, to this idea of philosophical void and emptiness, uh, we really wanted to uh, pay homage actually to this ontological duality that zero holds in itself. Uh, therefore, uh, the exhibition featured this beautiful installation by Jennifer T called the Atom Series from 2016, in which the artist really merged the reflection on uh, the origin of abstract art, which um, is exemplified by 
the drawings of Ilmaf Klimt that the artist uh, recalls in their artwork by uh, this abstract artist uh, that realized this series at the beginning of the 20th century with the language of the Taoist diagram. So very much as the concept of Shunya also in the Taoist diagrams opposite forces uh, occur into the creation and, the, and shaping the uh, reality itself. So uh, this um, is something that is really related to zero. Specifically, if we think that uh, in this specific installation, the physical and material language of sculpture really uh, merges and dialogue with this uh, intangible um, and tangible experience, which is the philosophical meditation. And speaking of uh, intangible uh, things that Zero really makes visible, I will invite you to join me to the next, uh, to the next artworks. Which are here on display and that have been made by uh, artist Jan Robert Lechte, both from 2020, uh, in the blink of an eye and drawing of a bottom. So um, what we really wanted to uh, do and to investigate through this exhibition uh, was also, of course, the role that digital technologies has in mediating reality nowadays. And this is really something um, timely, but also that the artist Jan Robert Lechte uh, really investigates into his own art, and specifically into these two artworks that are put here almost into dialogue, the one with the other one. So we have, on one hand, the performativity of the machine. So this average smartphone is structured to count during a human high blink. And on the opposite side, we have the performativity of the human beings, of the artists that reappropriate of the gesture of drawing, but always playing with this perception and with, this, uh, with these two bottoms, which uh, can stand for the on and off, the one and zeros, and true and null. Uh, so we still have this reflection about this subtle membrane that separates the offline from the online realm. And um, the question might be at this point, especially in this pandemic, post-pandemic, if we, if we can call like this, um, this specific moment, can we really uh, make a distinction between the online and the offline realms? And these two realms are really uh, separate uh, the one from another or uh, they are completely merged uh, as things are uh, right now. So um, this playing in perception uh, are really, uh, is really present here in this, uh, in this artwork especially in this, uh, in this serious uh, blink of an eye, where we can finally see what's behind the user interface. So of course, uh, being at the base of binary code zero is the founding language of binary systems, uh, and so of computer, of course, computer technologies. But here, something so untangible, such as the digits that uh, are present behind the user interface become a sculptural object. So there is this game also between this uh, intangibility and also so uh, physicality uh, and of the, the material itself in this uh, series in the blink of an eye. Uh, as a bottom line, the old artworks um, displayed in this exhibition have the quality uh, of uh, making things that we cannot really see perceivable and visible. And this is something that is really uh, deeply related to the concept of zero itself. Indeed, I would like to invite you discovering this cabin in which very much uh, in line with the scientific discoveries made possible by zero, specifically uh, concerning quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and general relativity, which are all fields that occur in studying phenomena such as black holes, zero has been uh, fundamental. And thanks to this collaboration between this uh, artist duo, composed by Evelina Dominic and Dmitry Helfand, with LIGO, uh, Mark Schoma, and also with William Bazinski, that made the soundtrack of this installation called ER is APR from 2017, we can really have the perception of what happens when two um, rotating black holes really um, create each other. Well, the introduction of the number zero, of course, has been fundamental for the development of scientific fields such as quantum physics, quantum mechanics, or general relativity, uh, which uh, both occur into studying phenomena such as uh, black holes. And these black holes, um, 
which uh, temperature is estimated in being the absolute zero, uh, are this uh, huge region of the time space uh, which gravitational pull really um, drag with it everything and nothing can escape their pull, not even light. So uh, when it comes to such a huge phenomenon that responds to this extreme physics law, uh, our um, mind and imagination is really challenged. Um, and uh, of course, it's really hard to imagine such a phenomenon. So in this installation, we can really uh, play with this perception as well as black holes uh, themselves play with, with human perception uh, of reality and how it is represented. So speaking about playing with perception, we are now going to visit the last but not least artwork of the exhibition starting from zero. So here we are with the last artwork on display in the exhibition and uh, this artwork really recalls this uh, avant-garde movement Zero Group which was formed uh, after the Second World War in Dusseldorf and uh, the, um, the artists that founded this movement really wanted to name uh, itself Zero Group because Zero stands uh, for this um, ground from this blank page which is uh, full of possibilities for a new beginning. And this was very much needed, especially after the destruction of the Second World War, when uh, it was needed to rebuild destructed cities, but also to start again to experiment in art. So the group really started to experiment with uh, materials, really poor materials, such as the aluminium foil, playing with perception, investigating how these materials interact with light and movement, for instance, uh, creating these beautiful optical artworks in which colors are really predominant. But still, they also uh, experimented with performances and with uh, happenings uh, in the late 1960s, uh, 50s, be beginning of 1960s. And uh, the artist, the author of this installation that is called Solaris, and it's from 2013, uh, the author is Nikki Hassman, and the author really um, is influenced by uh, the reflection of the Zero Group on uh, colors, movements, and, and light. Uh, indeed, the, uh, her installation, uh, Solaris, really plays with our perception but it really also occupies a physical space and as we can see from the subtle screens in which these beautiful colors uh, appear we can also uh, can relate uh, this artwork to the idea of expanded cinema but also uh, to visual music and these beautiful colors that the artist calls hyper colors are always different and really can remind you this uh, duality of zero as a nothingness and infinity. But also, if we pay attention of how subtle these uh, screens are, uh, we can also reflect on uh, yeah, the ephemerality uh, of our existence um, and uh, of nature itself, since it's also an investigation that the author uh, is really much uh, into um, conducting uh, through uh, her artworks. Uh, but still, if we uh, get close to the the artworks, the, um, the performativity of the medium and of these screens is something that also uh, is combined with um, the uh, interaction of the beholder with the artworks itself, which stands not only with um, the physical interaction, so we just uh, cannot uh, play with the machine while uh, spinning it round, but we can also reflect our image within the machine itself. Therefore, very much as the concept of Sunyata, uh, where um, both the subjects and the objects merge and are made by the same substance, by reflecting our image into the artwork, we can ask, is this artwork also standing for uh, Sunya? So it is also something that uh, can be related to the uh, artwork itself. So thank you very much for your attention and I, I hope you will enjoy our event. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, welcome with this part on the FU Art Science uh, Laboratory. My name is uh, Raoul Freese, and I'm one of the uh, founders of that laboratory. It's a great pleasure to be here also with uh, Evelina Domnich and uh, Dimitri Galfand, because they were also co-founders of that uh, laboratory many uh, five years ago. And why did we start such a laboratory? Um, well, we wanted to do research together. There was a, uh, the Dutch Science Foundation also recognized uh, the need for artists and designers to co-create or collaborate with scientists. And they funded a uh, project for us, also with another artist, Ivan Henriquez, and also with a postdoc, uh, Vincent Friebe. 
And in order to execute our project, uh, we started a laboratory, a physical space at the physics and astronomy department. Uh, nowadays, that laboratory has become a little bit bigger. More artists have uh, been working there, uh, also on projects. And what I think is special about this laboratory is that the artists and the scientists are both uh, working at the university uh, equally. So it's not a artist doing a residency with the scientist, but they are basically uh, fellow researchers, just like a scientist is also a researcher uh, in such a specific project. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Dimitri and Evelina's uh, artwork is also now visible at the FU Art Gallery. Um, I think it's quite unique in the Netherlands, but maybe there are also not many places in the world where universities have a art science laboratory and an art science gallery uh, just on the same uh, spot. And it is becoming more and more uh, recognized that these type of collaborations uh, really uh, have value, uh, crea can create impact uh, on the participants, on the scientists and the artists, but also on society, uh, create innovations, uh, encourage discussions and also critical reflections on uh, technology, for instance. And in one of such projects, we are now also participating, it's called uh, Studiotopia, and that is a European-wide uh, project where several uh, artists and many scientists participate. And it's a bit of a, um, in the program, what we try to do is to basically flip the hierarchy. So there are many artists that work with scientists, uh, not in special dedicated labs, but in the laboratories of the scientist, him or herself. Um, but then there's always a bit of a hierarchy. So the artist have to, has to be very happy to be invited and has to be, have a very special project that is very much of interest of that particular scientist. And it's always very difficult for artists to uh, get a foot between the door. Uh, and in order to flip that hierarchy, uh, are we and also many of our European uh, partners thought to uh, flip that and to create the scientist in residency. Um, so here a scientist is actually taking up a residency with, with the artist to reflect also on uh, their art, but also maybe to make uh, art, to contribute to work of the artist, maybe to make work of their own, we don't know. At least what we like that is there, that there is a start of a conversation, that people start to learn from each other and that it's a journey. And Maybe and as part of that type of journey and that type of conversation, we decided also to have an intervention in the art exhibition here at the VU, where scientists were invited to visit uh, the artworks, to look at it, to reflect on it, and they were recorded uh, by video crew, by camera crew. And what you're about to see is a series of the clips of this much longer uh, videos that we made of their response, also for ana analysis, but now also for your viewing. It's a bit as if you have a, a companion as you are looking at the artworks. One of the scientists that is working at the FU or in Amsterdam uh, is your companion. And you, you are just listening to the ideas of, uh, and the thoughts of such a scientist on the works. So we hope that you will enjoy those uh, videos. And uh, we will talk about that after we have uh, watched them. What is beyond these experiences? What is beyond these colors? It's inviting me to come and play. Okay, this is nice. Now I'm really feeling like a child, <laughs> enjoying the colors. Ah, so many nice colors. They are finding their own path in the whole universe. It also reminds me of our own movements from childhood to, you know, grown up. 
because there are so many movements and you can't predict the movements because there is no movement up, up, up like a linear part. Sometimes it's like you are walking and you think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching something and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, I'm falling. Same like these colors. Some are moving up, some are falling down. But you have to enjoy it because otherwise you will become crazy thinking, oh, I have to read something. But spirituality is not about reaching something. It's being. I, I think this work, the nice thing is that it invites to play. So you become a child and everyone likes that. So you don't have to put too many words to it. Uh, but if you want to analyze, then you have to see, okay, how much is a person open to, to that space of happening? Because if you are really control-oriented, you want to have a certain output and that uh, conviction that this is my space to, to put this input, to have that output, then you don't give a space to that happening. And then it can become a bit um, too much confronting because you don't know what can happen even in a second. It isn't happening because I can't do anything to say this is what I do and this is, would be the output. The, the, the patterns, the colors, they happen. But at the same time, there is this interaction that intervenes. And at the same time, it's kind of giving me space to be. For me, it was inviting to go to the boundless realm of infinity. And I also saw the bubbles and that reminded me of zero. To me, zero is in the middle uh, between infinity and form, an unmanifested realm in us. And I think this work reminds me of that realm. Zero is like home in, in spirituality. And I like being at home as everyone. It's a nice experience to connect, to interact with Solaris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the first film. Uh, my name, as Wendy said already, is Katja Kwasbeck. I'm professor of uh, contemporary art history here at Freie Universität. And what I want to do in the next hour, where well, we have a break in between, but in total it's going to be uh, uh, an hour, to discuss these uh, different films. We are going to screen the films, and then I'm going to discuss them with uh, the artists or the scientists. Uh, or both, uh, that depends a bit on each of the films. So this first uh, film that you just saw is uh, uh, filming uh, Shada Nandram, who is professor of Hindu spirituality and society at our faculty of religion and theology. And what uh, we asked her, and that's actually what we asked all of uh, the scientists that we invited into the gallery is to really come with a fresh reaction on the artworks without also having researched too much on them beforehand. So that's maybe um, important to know. And they also haven't had any discussions with um, the artists before, apart from uh, in the, la uh, the last work uh, that Raoul already talked about uh, by Dimitri and Evelina. But we're going to come back to that later. So uh, one thing maybe still to uh, mention also about uh, Shada Nandram is that she is really closely involved in that project of the Zero Origin Foundation. So she was really also 
the link of this project or one of the links of this project with that um, research project of, uh, on the origin of zero. But now I'm really happy to say hello to Nikki Asman, who is here with us uh, today, uh, the artist of the work that uh, you just saw uh, and that Maria also played a bit with during her guided tour. Uh, so welcome. Maybe we can ask uh, with uh, just you saying, well, how did you feel about that interpretation by Shada Nandram? How did you? Yeah, it was a. It? I really liked this interpretation, um, and where I could uh, connect with her also is that she sees it as this. Um, so the soap film is sort of like a window, a portal, an intervention in the space, and for me, this connects to this concept of zero that. Uh, you have something before and after. It's 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 dividing literally the space, and um, how she connects it to infinity is quite nice. And I think for me, it it is something that it connects to the in between. So the in between is this moment of pause, or uh, in Japan they call it the ma, the negative space. And you also have it in cinema. This work is referenced to cinema uh, with the soap film being this abstract film that plays before you. Um, and I think it is a moment that you are not thinking in the past, you are not thinking in the future, you are in the now and you are observing and perceiving. And that makes it a very uh, a momentary, momentary piece. Uh, and I think this is what she's also relating to uh, in, her, in her comments. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, I also found her comments really fascinating, I have to say, also because, well, I'm an art historian, so of course, if you would have put me in front of that work, I would have had very different reactions. I, I would probably have thought of some kind of media archaeology, also with the mechanics, like of scrolling through a film roll, or what you said, yeah. like abstract film, uh, also expanded cinema was already mentioned. So um, how, uh, I mean, this, of course, is a very specific Form, what, what we staged here is a very specific form of art sites interaction because actually Sharda came kind of blank to the work and didn't interact with you much before. Uh, but how would you see your um, relation with scientific research generally? Do you see y yourself as someone who is kind of an, uh, doing artistic research? So is there very much interaction with the exact sciences as an example to create these works? I think what I would call it more is artistic experiments. and. I generally start with something that I only know one thing about the work which triggers me or one observation. So for instance with the soap film, I was working with uh, soap bubbles, soap film, and then it was a moment that the sun uh, entered the, the room where I was working and uh, reflected the colored light of the soap film. And this is what got me into a deeper research of, of delving into the workings of the light, iridescence, uh, colors, uh, the breaking of the light. and. So I think I enter something completely without knowledge and then I just start to experiment. And sometimes you can approach uh, or you can um, use the same methodology, like you have a hypothesis, you have a theory, like I think this is, and then you start to change one par parameter at a time to get to the same result. But I think I would not, I have also this freedom without being hindered by uh, uh, that it has to be true or that it has to be proven or uh, so in that sense uh, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, compare it to a scientific uh, mythology. Um, yeah, so usually it's one thing that triggers me which makes me go delve into it deeper and by experimenting I come to something uh, and I think uh, I'm not hindered in that aspect that I'm not limited by what it cannot do or can do because uh, I just figure this out as I go along. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think what's also really nice and also what, what you were you were saying at the beginning that of course there is this interest in, in material, there's this interest in the like let's say chemical properties of soap. Uh, but there's also that interest in the more spiritual uh, reflections that it can evoke. And this is what, what Chada was focusing on. Uh, but I'm still wondering if you um, if you say and you're also saying on your website that you're engaged that you have a background in film and art science. So if you think of art science for you, would that include something like uh, Hindu spirituality? So 
Um, no, I think, uh, and this, I make abstract work, and I think what the nice thing about this is that people can, uh, they have the freedom to, to connect to, uh, to the artwork with their own uh, background, mind, associations, and I think it's really nice that everybody has their own perception and experience with the work, and I think for me, it's not so much a spiritual uh, uh, relationship, but more, for instance, I have a background in film, and I, uh, and I make installations that are more uh, in the realm of expanded cinema. So you play with different schemes. I make screens from, from soap film, metal grids, uh, acrylic plates, or LEDs. And, and then this window, the screen is always this window to which you can be, uh, to which you relate to. And um, for me, it connects to, in cinema, you are in this dark uh, womb and you are watching a film and then there's sometimes this moment that you sort of doze off but not really and then you snap back into reality and then you have thought of something completely uh, that you, you connected to things that you didn't and I think this is something that also happens for me in the train for example and then the window is the train window and the landscape passing by in this certain rhythm cadence and then I also tend to connect m m things that I wouldn't connect before and uh, the windows of the soap film are for me a sort of similar reaction. I, I think in this moment of being in the now, you you sort of defragmentize things and you connect things unaware, of, un unconsciously. Uh, this is for me what I like about it and how it relates to cinema. This this uh, this moment of uh, in between. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So is that also? I mean, when you were uh, approached and uh, you learned that this is going to be an exhibition about zero, was that something that was kind of w your work would naturally connect to, or did that establish a new possibility of interpretation for you? Because of course, I see that this idea of the threshold, the limit, that that's very close also to some of these interpretations yeah. of that number. So in 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 my work, I don't work with the concept of zero, but I. I I do relate it to this, this, uh, these screens being like windows or portals uh, that are connecting to this moment of pause or in-betweenness. Uh, so for me, the concept of zero relates to this, um, and you can and you have the before and the after. In the film, you also see she's being filmed from the front and from the back of the soap film, and from the back you don't see any colors, and from the front you see all the colors. So there's this different way of looking at things, and I think it comes together in this, this, this thin layer of uh, soap film. Uh. Okay, I think, well, we, we'll open up to the audience soon, but maybe one last question for me, because I think this is very interesting also with your specific interest in film. So now we have a film and it, it shows that they put quite a bit of effort in trying yeah, to yeah, capture yeah. your work on film again. So yeah. it's a work that engages with film that has been filmed in a way that is even slightly artistic in itself. So do you have any reaction on how they like staged this Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We reception? both connected. So this work is part of a triptych on soap film. Uh, the first being Solace, uh, a, a more monumental setup with two screens and then automated. So you're, you're a viewer in a, in a space. Seeing the two large soap films, uh, uh, make, uh, there's a composition for the two large soap films. This is the second piece, Solaris. And the third piece is liquid solid, and they all have the word soul referring to the sun um, uh, in it. And the third piece was uh, uh, me and another artist called Joris Schreibels filming the soap film with a macro lens. And what they did was basically the same, uh, but then we did it in uh, conditions of minus 30 degrees because we wanted to research how the soap film would behave when it was freezing and they uh, slowed it down uh, uh, in the film. So I think the material is, is, is rich enough that you can approach it from different uh, angles and it's very nice to experiment with. Uh, so yeah, I, I can see uh, 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 it has much more to it uh, than just one artwork. Okay, thanks so much. Do we have questions from the audience? We have one question and that is uh, regarding uh, Maria introduced your work in the, in the tour, in the first video that we saw and that, uh, y uh, she mentioned the Zero Group and uh, you're, uh, you're, that you are inspired by the Zero Group and the question is regarding what, how has the Zero Group influenced your artistic practice? Um, so it was not an inspiration for this art piece but I uh, uh, got acquainted with the work of Otto Pina. 
so he was a member of the fo uh, founding member of the Zero uh, uh, movement, and uh, uh, in which, by the way, colors were and it was more black white, not colors. But he himself, as an individual artist, and his work, I, I heard him speak uh, just before he died in New York. And the way he talked about his own work and his approach uh, and the work he made, uh, yeah, I really connected to this. And uh, I had actually quite, uh, uh, yeah, his work, his own work is quite uh, um, colorful and uh, 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 dealing with the sun, uh, working with the elements and the material. And here, how I work with material is always trying to bring uh, the color that is inherent to the material in this sort of uh, hyper-realistic way uh, forward. And so, yeah, I think um, uh, uh, this, this inspiration or kinship or, or um, being inspired by is, is more with this artist uh, that was part of Zero. Okay, thanks for that uh, question. That was, uh, it's also we will see that there is um, uh, quite a few connections also to earlier artworks, art movements in some of the works. So we will for sure come back also to these more like art historical components in um, after the break. So now we are going to have a break until uh, five o'clock. Uh, thanks for now and hope you can get some tea or refreshments uh, before coming back.
six, that's seven, it goes to seven. Seven hundred thousand. Eight, five, eight, a hundred. 859,595. I don't know if it starts at zero. Can I go and check? Does it start at zero or does it start? Uh, no, it starts at one. Damn it. Should have started at zero. Um, so, so that one you expect since the theme is, is zero, you expect that the, the number counting starts at zero. The other one, it took me longer to, to understand. This is weird. This, this, I feel that three-dimensionality, so this looks like a pressed button, and this looks like one that comes towards me, like switched on, switched off. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, concept of binary. Uh, so things are either zero or one. Uh, there's one. So we generally we are used to counting from in, in base ten, uh, but computers um, think in base two. So either something is a zero or a one, uh, and then you start combining zero and ones uh, to to represent other numbers. So you can translate all these numbers here; they are in base ten, and you can transform those into base two with zero and ones, and then you probably have um, I don't know how many more uh, panels. I mean, zero is the beginning of everything, and then little by little you build on top, because in, in, uh, in computer science you start counting at zero, you don't start counting at one. So whenever you have a list, it starts from zero and then it goes one, two, three. I associate this a lot with, um, uh, well, the, the beginning of everything, uh, the beginning of the universe. Uh, uh, at some point, there was a moment zero for, for our existence. Zero is exciting if I think of zero as the beginning of a series and things that will develop and, and evolve. If I think of zero as uh, the null and there's nothing, well, that's a bit scary, I think. Actually, that's yeah, my feeling. If you, see, if you see it as the beginning of everything, then it gives you uh, strength. I mean, I can talk for myself, of course, but it gives you strength of, for going forward. Okay, so what you just witnessed was, uh, whom you just witnessed actually, was Ilaria Tiddy, who is uh, also working here at the Freie Universität as Assistant Professor Artificial Intelligence. And she, uh, we asked her to look at, comment uh, upon the work of Jan-Robert Lichte, who is here with me today. Um, welcome, Jan-Robert. Uh, great that you are here. Uh, you actually have been working in the field of computational art, we could say, since a long while already, but it's, mm, well, also not so quite recently, but since the 2000s that you really also try to not only work uh, on the computer or in internet art, something that is shown on the internet, but really also produce pieces for galleries, right, that can be shown uh, in the gallery. So uh, the first question I have for you is the question that Ilaria also had. Why is it that there is no zero in that work? Why does, do the numbers not start with zero? Yeah, uh, it's a very good point because, yeah, that's how computers count. But uh, the, work, the work is very much, all my work is about the interface and the, I would say about describing a phenomenology of computers. So it's very, um, there's just so far you can go as a human being in understanding the computer. And I find it a complete wondrous and fascinating machine and, and contribution to our reality. Uh, and I'm still trying to understand it. And everything behind the interface is basically invisible. It's, it's this, it's this um, 
this ocean of voltages and, and, and electrons and, and in a completely different temporal world and everything. And that is pretty, it's pretty much what the world work is about. So the counting is always a gesture to the human. So it's very much like a kid would start one, two, three, four. So that I, I chose to start with one because that is our, our way of counting. Um, but yes, I get it. A computer would start at zero. So it's, uh, you were trying to imagine the non-computer scientists looking at the work rather, who would say, well, I start counting with one, where she immediately as a computer scientist would say, yeah. well, I would start counting with zero. So we already did a kind of translation yeah. towards a, a broader public, one could say. Well, and but it's not only that, but I believe there is the computer, there is just the interface. And a computer scientist would say, no, I understand what's happened behind it. But from, a, from my point of view, there is only the interface. So and the interface is always a, a gesture to the human perceiver, because um, anything beyond that you can't see. Um, so that is, that is probably the choice I made. And uh, yeah. also if you're a, a child, you a young child will just not get a zero. They just wouldn't understand what it is, so it always starts counting with a one. Um, so that's our human condition, probably. Yeah. So um, we have to read this work. It's four panels, right? And the reason that there's kind of a little white space on the last is that you really try to translate that blink of an eye, that moment that an I, that uh, what, what a computer could calculate or what a smartphone could calculate while we were looking at it. And yeah. that's, that information just is stops. just not enough for four panels. So exactly. that's why. Yeah. So it's really trying to show this like moment. Yeah, because yeah, then you really feel it is a, a, it's just a sequence of, 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 of counting plus that it's, I usually then just f try and find a very, uh, that, that was your question also, leaving the screen which again is, of course, just an interfacial layer, but leaving the computer's domain into a physical work. I usually just try and just follow the logic of these choices. So then it's, then you, then you arrive at a point sort of, um, at what size can you print with a certain technique? And that is a certain size of paper. So that is then a limitation. Then you, uh, then I want like square panels. And then you just follow that. Then you end up with four and just ends there. So it's, there's, there's a logic to the choice in, in what I made this, uh, made this. Um, and I distinctly, uh, and of course it works well. So yeah. it, it, it's good, it makes it very clear, sort of, okay, that's, people instinctively walk there, check it, check yeah, the last that's, digit. That's what's really nice about yeah. her reaction, right? That you really feel this, this idea of, well, I, I try to get it, yeah. I, I really, she, you see her thinking in a way and trying to make sense. Yeah. of the work and getting it to a certain point, but then also still keeping, staying slightly confused in a way of yeah. why really you made these choices. On, uh, in the work description, it actually says that you have been adding a color gradient to the density scale. Yeah, I'll try and explain Can that. Can you explain that Well, to of us? course, what, what I like about this work is it, it's extreme simplicity. So why did I, I chose iteration? Because iteration is a fundamental it's a very core principle of a computer. A computer does bit shifting and, and iterating is a, is a very pure principle. So if you just give the computer the instruction to iterate, you're really on to the processor. It, it's, a very, it's a very fundamental thing. Plus that it's, it's so, it goes to, it, if you would take an, an algorithmic concept, it's like the most boring one there is. Sort of, if you would, oh, so basically it's, a, it's an algorithmic art piece, a generative art piece, super boring counting, just iterating by one. Um, so this is, that very core principle of the computer uh, spits this out, but I was really, really amazed by the, the texture and the level of detail in the work. So it, it, it looks like you're looking at, a, at, a, at, a, at waves in an ocean or something. So, and that is basically just the, the letter density. So a, an eight is, has a lot of black in it, whereas a one has less black. And everything in between has a, has a different grayscale in a way. So you get this, this play in density, which gives the texture and which produces these wavy, wavy lines. Um, what I did, because it's, in a way, this is an algorithmic landscape. It's, it's, it, I created, I wrote an algorithm for a landscape, which is just iterating, which is sort of ironical. Um, and just to add to the sort of the artistic choice, I, 
I took, I created a simple palette of colors based on a photo of a, um, in this case, a seascape. But for other ones, I did like woodlands or mountain. So I injected colors into the numbers just to sort of make them painterly um, as, as a sort of an artistic, uh, yeah, what is it? Painterly touch to it. Uh, again, very simple, very simple and just uh, this is the end result, sort of a very brutal, simple landscape. Okay, so many aesthetic choices in the end, in, in the end result also. Yeah, the size, the, yeah, the, the, the color element, uh, but that's about it. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's yeah, a simple work. Yeah. So what I also would like to ask you is, uh, well, I already mentioned that you have really, right, you're what we would call a computer artist or a media artist or a new media artist or a digital artist, whatever. It's actually a, a group of within contemporary art uh, that have been working very close to the exact sciences since, since a very long while already. I mean, actually since cybernetics, so since the 1950s at least. Uh, still, I, I would guess that you see, I don't know if you see yourself within this, what is often labeled as an art science field. So how do you see the, your relation to computer science? Do you see yourself as a, um, like needing their help in a way, going back to their theories to understand what you're doing? Or are you re rather tinkering along with them or even pioneering in your work? It's a good one. I, um, I also summarize my practice very briefly in one sentence um, to distinguish what I do to a lot of people using computers in art. I say, I, uh, I don't use software to make art, but I make art about software. So it's, it's, I flip it around. And that, is, that, com that concises it pretty neatly. So I see the computer also as a muse. Uh, it's literally my point of fascination. And I'm trying to really get it through making art. Um, and by doing that, I'm, I'm sort of not that much interested in the engineering per se, because I get it. I know how computers work, but it's from a perceptive point, I don't. And I think, I think that's sort of on a philosoph philosophical level, I find it far more interesting. And also, like these temporal uh, sort of differences uh, between our temporal uh, cognitive experience and the one of a machine. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. And um, where is it? Oh, this is how we made it. Yeah, but the, the actual experience of it is very different. And that I find very interesting. And I've, I've been looking often in, of course, I read my media theory and everything, but often it was much more about media than sort of this, this sort of philosophical approach. But I have stumbled into philosophers who are sort of writing philosophy about computing and everything and then that's the part where I find interesting but usually I just borrow a lot from our historical uh, ways of looking ways of tr seeing disciplines and sort of bashing them against the machine and seeing where they stick or where it breaks off and um, we, we were mentioning uh, Eastern re uh, philosophy or religion or uh, there's concepts there which I find very relevant in dealing with the sort of the performativity, the fluidity of the machine, but also its, its staging solidity, which is something you, you see a lot in Eastern, Eastern philosophy as well. So I usually borrow from different fields. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, also, of course, this work is a very philosophical work, in, for me at least, in that yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. And I really like sitting in front of it because it feels so much also what we are doing here because we are constantly told that we are offline or online uh, during this event. So it's really nice to have that symbolized also uh, behind us. But we don't have so much time anymore. I, I still wanted to confront you with one statement that we are actually still going to hear, which is by uh, Florian Schreck, who is also in the audience. But in his film that we are still going to watch, he says that uh, while science needs to be precise, in art, precision would be boring. And while scientists try to get rid of all the noise, art wants to be misunderstood. Would you? I mean, of course, that was said concerning another artwork, but I was just wondering, is that something that you would also see for yourself? That it's n not trying to get rid of the noise, but rather featuring it, things like I, that? I think, I think what I just said sums up as pretty well. It's, if it's very much about the experience, so it's, it's contemplative in a way and that is a different approach to understanding so when you understand something it sort of 
it in a way it can also flatten it or make it. Uh, but the contemplative part is where you, yeah, where you feel the actual presence and the differences, and that can be really profound. But that is an experience you have in science as well, a lot. I mean, there's so many profound insights by contemplating uh, contemporary physical theories. Uh, they really blow your mind. So it, it, there's not that much difference. But I, I try not to over-explain, but more yeah, to open a door so people can experience it more directly and, and, and just see for themselves what they feel. Great. Thanks so much. Do we have questions from the audience? Uh, we have one, and that's about drying off the button and uh, with the question... Oh, that's great, because I yeah. didn't have yeah. time to <laughs> get the into that. The question is, which... Uh, the, 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 it's the binary system, and in the video there is, uh, there is said that one is one and the other one is zero, but the question is, which one is one and which one oh, is wow. zero? Which one... <laughs> what, what is what? Well, in your interpretation, then, as the artist. From an interface design point of view, um, this is the neutral state. Yeah. And that's the active state. Yeah. So that would be the one, and this would be the yeah. zero. Uh, but from an aesthetic point of view, you could see that one as a sort of emptiness, and there's a fullness. You could flip it around. But I'll leave it up to the viewer as well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Jan Robert. And we already have to move to the next film. So, um, which is going to be about uh, the work of Jennifer T. <laughs> As a mathematician, I have the feeling the zero is staring at me in the face. In the middle of the painting, it is there and it's saying, hello, I am zero. Infinity is, is, is somewhere around. My first impression is that I'm walking a little bit to the cosmos. Although the work is called Atomic, I have more the feeling I'm looking at planets. It's like the universe. So the artist is looking at the miniature level of atoms, but is drawing it out to a cosmic level. Also, the artworks are trying to express nothingness. It's outer space, there's nothing there, there's only the zero, nothing else. But as a mathematician, it still feels like I'm looking to the dimen two-dimensional space with the zero in the middle, spreading out infinity somewhere, out of reach. The contrast between zero and infinity that the artist was trying to express. And so there you see the relationship between zero and infinity, because if you divide by zero, you get infinity, which is not inside the domain of numbers. And then you could say, well, what I do is I can take infinity and I take it into the real numbers and add it. It's also a real number. This is actually the projective plane. And that's especially what I see with these physical spheres. I have the feeling a little bit like the projective plane. And then also if you do that, then zero is nicely at the bottom. Infinity is nicely at the top. So it also shows the kind of contrast there are and at the same time the relationship between zero and infinity. Take a sheet of paper. And now start folding it over an apple, so to speak. The mathematician can fold it nicely over the apple, but since it spreads out to infinity, you can get higher and higher and higher and higher, but you never get to this closing point. Uh, you go from a non-compact space to a compact space, and that doesn't fit. But you can make it fit by saying, mm, I put the infinity on top. I just close it up by an extra element and then you get a projective plane. Zero and infinity are basically two sides of the same coin because they're basically each other's twin brothers. Yeah? They, they have the same arithmetic properties. Zero is easily forgotten and you should never forget it. I think what this artwork is expressing is 
don't forget me. I am zero. I'm here. Okay, so we have a bit of a different setting this time because unfortunately uh, Jennifer uh, couldn't make it today. Uh, so I will try to provide a bit of context for her work myself. But in this case, we have uh, one Fokking who reacted to the work. Actually, also not here in this room, but uh, online. One, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, okay. welcome. So uh, great you could make it. So let me immediately uh, get started with uh, my first question. And that is, um, if I'm not fully mistaken, Maria and Wenda had first asked you to actually comment on the work of uh, Jan Robert or to react to it, but you really insisted to engage with Jennifer's work. So why that? Um, actually, I didn't understand it in that way, but it's very well possible that I was supposed to uh, comment on Jan Robert's com uh, artworks, but I really liked the way that Zero was presented in Jennifer T's work, the kind of abstraction that she was making, and so it appealed to me. Okay, so you think you would have seen this close relation to Zero in her work also if you wouldn't have come across it in this exhibition context? Uh, no, I, I think it was really that it was explained, so I looked at the explanations and this gave me a kind of context. Although I was expecting more atomic artworks, and when I looked at it, I also expressed it, it felt more like cosmos to me. But that's also kind of nice, because on the one hand, Jennifer T is having this contrast between zero and infinity, and on the other side, she has this contrast between the atomic level that she's trying to express, and the cosmic level that me, as a viewer, is, uh, is more the impression. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I agree. So maybe um, as, as Jennifer cannot be here, we can give a little bit more background also on her work. So she is an artist with a very diverse body of work. Many of you will probably know another work of hers because it's actually uh, shown uh, in the metro station uh, of uh, Amsterdam Central. It's a, a huge work uh, that is actually a photographic reproduction of a collage that is make made from tulip petals and it's called navigating uh, the river of the world uh, where she is referring to um, actually uh, a ceremonial textile used in Sumatra. I'm just saying that this is of course not what we are discussing here but uh, it really shows how she's interested in making kind of knowledge systems resonate across time and space. So bringing different cultures, knowledge systems together also from the past and, uh, uh, and also different scales. And maybe that's also something you were already referring to one that it's this specific work, the atom series is about both like the, the, the atom and space. So the very small and the very big. Uh, what is also interesting, and I was already alluding to this, that we have several work he works here that also like may have references to earlier works in the history of art, because in this work, uh, Jennifer T engages with a Swedish painter from the early 20th century, Hilma af Klimt, and maybe we can show one of her drawings uh, by our by Hilma af Klimt, uh, her aquarelle drawings, uh, uh, because it really shows how um, Jennifer T took her works as a kind of starting point to translate uh, the idea of the, that really pioneering abstract painter of the 1920s. And, and that, that's, that's really also something that, it, that I think we have to um, take into account because we are also talking here about the relation to the sciences and about innovation or ideas in the sciences that are somehow reflected upon by artists. And Af Klimt was really very early in uh, acknowledging was, what, what was happening in physics at the time, um, which was, um, of course, a, a very interesting times within physics also, with, with all these discoveries around atoms in the early 20th century. Uh, with, uh, um, and so she had created these drawings, but actually knew that they were so much ahead of their time that she said they shouldn't be published only until after 20 years after her death. So actually she only became uh, known even in the 1980s. Um, so um, I think that that's 
that's quite interesting how now uh, 100 years later, Jennifer T is going back to these works and transferring their aesthetics into three dimensions as a kind of uh, honoring this early artist who was already engaging with uh, scientific um, discoveries in a way, but also very much restaging them in a different way. And um, also, as an example, she uses photographs of enlightened matches. So it's really a mix between scientific model, constructivist art exhibition, and um, so a very broad um, association also bringing together of these different knowledge systems, which is typical for her. So to get back to you one, sorry for like, this kind of length, lengthy uh, explanation in between. You state several times then in your engagement with the work that as a mathematician, I do read it this and that way. So do you really think that your professional background, your discipline made you read the work in a very specific way? In part, yes, because as a mathematician, I've looked very often, for instance, at the projective plane, which uh, what I explained in the in the movie is a sphere. And so when I see this object, this sphere, it immediately casts me back to this kind of geometrical object I have sort of seen as a mathematician. Also, partly because if I sum up my own research in just a few sentences, I'm studying computer systems. Say if you fly a plane, you want to be certain that the software in the plane is correct. But then you have to reason about it as a mathematical object. And in these mathematical objects are zeros and ones, etc. So you have to also make a very precise, abstract representation of that. And in the sense, to go back to the artwork, I could also say that Jennifer T is also trying to do this, but as an artist. So she's trying to make an abstract representation of something very concrete, namely zero, infinity, the natural numbers. And so in that sense, it also re resonates with me. So can you imagine using this work in one of your lectures to explain the concept of infinity to your students? Yes, I think I could. So also when I give a lecture, I have to explain how you very precisely specify the natural numbers in a different way than you're used to at high school. And I could also imagine then showing this artwork not to really explain the workings of it, but a lecture is also a little bit theater. Especially I'm lecturing to 650 students. That's more theater than, than, than lecturing in a sense. And this artwork could really help to bring alive this kind of lecture. Yeah, in, in any case, you in, in your in your appearance in the film, I think you helped us very much also with your gestures to somehow translate some of the concepts you were alluding to, uh, to us or to uh, your viewers. Uh, so I, I found that really um, interesting and also, um, yeah, I, I learned a lot from it. So are there questions from the audience then? Uh, no. No, there are no questions from the audience. Uh, so they might have found it um, illuminating enough or is there something coming in we just come in uh, can you uh, professor fucking can you please tell us more about between divinity and it, it it just the 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 end of the question was just pulled by the person posting the question sorry yeah. so see we are really live yeah that we're really live the proof <laughs> that we are so uh, i think Maria is also trying to get the question right now. Uh, if I could only read faster. <laughs> no, we have time. Just take your time. No, no it, it isn't. It isn't here. It, okay, it, it, it isn't there. It, oh, wait. It, 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 can you See, please tell us? See, it's about visibility us? and invisibility. Yeah, uh, uh, now wait. I'm copying it so we can just read it uh, in our own pace. Uh, can you please tell us more about the relation between div dividing and the zero and infinity? Dividing by zero and infinity. Did you get that question, Van? Yes, I, I, get, I get it and I can tell a bit more. Great. So when you go to primary school, you're always taught don't divide by zero because it gives infinity, basically. In Dutch, it said, Dele door nul is flauwekul. And actually, it turns out 
that you can divide by zero and there, you can actually give it a value that makes sense. Namely, you can divide, you can define one defined divided by zero is zero. This is counterintuitive, but it turns out it mathematically works just fine. So you can make a mathematical framework that works just as we use it, where one divided by zero is equal to zero. Yeah, and that also shows the kind of relationship between zero and infinity again, because one divided by zero is infinity. But you can also define it is zero. Also in the, in the movie, I say that zero and infinity have very much the same properties. So they're kind of twin brothers or twin sisters. And that is also the reason why you can define one divided by zero to be zero and every, what, everything still works fine. It's amazing. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, well, I, I now, of course, would want to come back to the work in question in how far does this then relate to atoms and in how far does it relate to the cosmos? I know that we will also like move to that topic with uh, the next uh, film and the next discussion. But do you have anything concluding to say about that one before we um, move to the next film? My personal interpretation, now I really step away as a scientist, is in a sense, Jennifer T is expressing that on the minuscule level of atoms, things very much look like the planetary level of the cosmos. So we have these kernels of atoms, of molecules, and we have electrons circling around them. It's almost like the cosmos. And so the artwork for me is trying to say at a very miniature level, physics is very similar to the cosmic level. Okay, I would say that's a great concluding sentence and maybe we can come back to it with the next discussion for now. Thank you very much for joining us, even it from uh, remotely. And bye-bye, um, one. And we will move to the next film. Jellyfish, weird types of jellyfish going through the water. And sometimes they even collide and merge with each other. This artwork here provoke fantasy to rise up, or to, to feel a little bit of magic. Science can't explain everything. I mean, we are just doing approximations and try to explain as good as we can. But, but of course, uh, reality is much broader than that. And also science, I mean, at least my science, physics doesn't touch on emotions. It at the same time projects you into the outer space, but also into the microspace and quantum mechanics. If you go to quantum or if you go to outer space, you immediately get into these humongous numbers, but you need lots of zeros, <laughs> either behind the number or behind the comma before the number, to express your thoughts. And so it's, it's kind of funny that uh, here the optimization goes in different directions. Whereas a scientist would, would fight against all these little irregularities and would always producing exactly the same pattern. But at here, it would try to be precise, it would be boring, so nobody would want to look at it, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they interact here heavily with each other and that's exactly what you would not like to have in a real EPR, quantum cryptography experiment. But that is exactly what makes this artwork here really beautiful. Science, of course, lives from getting rid of all the noise and all the imprecision and making it really dry and exact and error bars. And so art is the opposite. They want to be misunderstood because association with lots of other things is enriching. Art. You need something like, like art to connect it to emotions in human life and, and make it um, inspirational. A more, I mean, it's already quite inspirational science, but um, this is a shortcut to the emotions and inspiration that, that are there in science. Yeah, it's, it's perhaps enriching 
in your experience in life. I mean, both science and art do it. And it's just another window which you shouldn't miss. Okay, we have a bit of a, again, different situation here, which is great also to end because this time we have both the scientists and uh, the artists uh, present. Well, one of the scientists, because you had also a colleague who was uh, working together with uh, the three of you in this uh, project, uh, Guillaume Schweicher. So welcome to Florian Schreck, who is a professor of experimental quantum physics at the University of Amsterdam, and to uh, Dimitri and uh, Evelina, Dimitri Gelfand and Evelina Domnitz, who are working together not only on this work, right, but you are working together on art science works, dealing with physics, chemistry, um, and uh, computer science since quite a while already. So we already heard that uh, Florian is actually one of those scientists who is scientist in residence within the Studiotopia project, and we also heard a bit of uh, by Raoul what, what the concept behind this is. So it showed, I would say, also in the video that you already gave quite a bit of thought as to these resonances in between art and science, and it was really nice to hear you uh, reflect on that. Uh, the downside is that, because we really wanted to have your statements on this in the video, much of the things you said about the work itself now didn't make it in this short version, so maybe it's also good also for the audience to learn a bit more about uh, the concept behind the work, also maybe explain the quite um, abstract, to me at least, abstract type title, ER uh, equals EPR. Uh, so now the question is whom should I address? I guess I, we should address Dimitri and Evelina first, and Florian can uh, add on if you think from your um, perspective of quantum physics there's something else you should elaborate on. So, so uh, the title refers to a, a theory. When we, uh, when Evelina and I had the extreme pleasure of um, uh, a residency with the LIGO group uh, at, at Caltech, this is the that LIGO uh, stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This was the group that first detected gravitational waves emanating from the collision of two black holes. And uh, our residency was in 2016, and in 2017, they, uh, this, this group uh, received the Nobel Prize for this uh, pivotal moment in, in the history of physics. And uh, it was there at Caltech that we uh, encountered Juan Maldacena, a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, string theorist, who presented this, this radical idea that ER, which um, refers to Einstein Rosen bridges, uh, which were later known as wormholes, equals EPR, and that's uh, Einstein Podolsky Rosen. Uh, that's another paper. These are two papers from 1935, um, uh, which has to do with quantum entanglement. So perhaps wormholes are a manifestation of quantum entanglement, which is, of course, quite a, 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 besides being a rather uh, unorthodox um, uh, take on, um, on 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 the workings of the cosmos. It also happens to be a way towards combining the, the distant realms of relativity and uh, quantum theory. And uh, actually, at the end of his lecture, um, Professor Maldacena mentioned that per perhaps some hydrodynamic models of, 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 this, uh, of this theory c will uh, emerge. And uh, later th that night, Evelina dreamt of this uh, hydrodynamic model. And uh, approximately a week later, we were already doing experiments in the Caltech swimming pool, uh, having asked uh, the swimmers to leave because they would disturb the experiment. <laughs> And uh, luckily, it uh, was, was, was quite a success. And uh, um, shortly thereafter, we were already uh, st starting to build the, the installation. 
Were you literally dreaming of it? I, s I woke up and I, s yeah, indeed I saw it in my dream. And the interesting thing that uh, Juan Montesena, he showed a picture which was a cover of a scientific American with an artist representation where there was some kind of a knot. So this wormhole was represented as a knot. And uh, I, I found it extremely, I found this um, ridiculous, ridiculous, <laughs> yeah, this uh, um, cover. And what I dreamt was quite simple as this uh, ring. And what is interesting that you, you do not see this wormhole, but these vortices are connected, the vortices. And you see it in the projection, and however, if you look in the theoretical physics, even if you have a wormhole, what, what is a wormhole? It can cr connect distant realities, distant dimension, distant worlds, but nonetheless, you cannot send information over the wormhole. So somehow it exists and it doesn't exist. And it has this very ephemeral presence in our installation as well. So it's almost like a, uh, uh, like a little um, strangeness in space-time, strangeness in topology, that's where the rotation of water happens. So, so do you see your work as illustrating that theory? Is that one of the main aims of the work then? Certainly not. Uh, we, we believe that uh, a well-conceived, um, well-executed scientific experiment is uh, is a work of art. Uh, we don't. Uh, we we actually, unlike uh, perhaps many uh, other standpoints, Evelina and I went into this domain over 20 years ago because we we don't uh, find any significant differences. We mainly see quite uh, some parallels, uh, but we never engage in illustration. And for that matter, we consider um, all of our work to. Uh, exist in a realm of abstraction that cannot represent anything at all, uh, that is open to any kind of interpretation. Yes, you can enter the room, and of course, given the, the background of, of, of that is il alluded to by the title, you can uh, go into cosmology and, and into this, this recent theory, uh, but uh, you can also uh, view it purely uh, from an aesthetic uh, and, and, and perceptual uh, standpoint. Yeah. And, it, yeah, <laughs> I, I was a naive observer. I just entered this room knowing about this title, and um, you first get a feeling of awe just by the sound and the, the patterns on the ceiling, and you forget that it's actually called EP, EPR, and you, you stand there for 15 minutes just looking at it, how does it work, and playing with it, before you again remember the title and then make the connections to, to the physics again. So it works. So, so you have not been involved in the coming into being of this work, Florian? No. No, so because your, sci your scientist residency is rather just starting. Yes, right. Mm. So mm. what, what do you, both sides, do you both have hope of, of getting from this, that cooperation from your residency? I mean, maybe uh, uh, for me, it's like this. I was always interested in art, but more as a passive observer, going to contemporary art exhibitions or my family, they are all involved with art. But uh, now I'm actively involved. Uh, I'm entering this world through you with your help. So that's very interesting for me. It's just uh, expanding my horizon. And we just started the journey of building an artwork, so I hope we will produce something beautiful, um, just as what you did before. Yes, and we're working on an artwork that um, can um, unveil a little bit, uh, bring um, to the scale of our senses the, uh, the, the, the movement of light in space. So this, uh, the, the vorticity of light. Yes. So it is actually in, in many ways related. Well, we, we have a quite, quite uh, a fascination um, with uh, vortices and uh, it, it's... Um, yes, so it engages vortices but created by single light waves. And uh, to your question about theory and illustration of theory, we have to keep in mind that uh, our theories and science, it's just... Um, games of our mind, approximations, that reality is so much bigger and broader and uh, 
of course, our fascination is with reality, but the way it uh, corresponds with the working of our consciousness, with understanding, it's also great. And I like how in the video Florian says that, oh, if you try to make it always spin the same way, that would be boring. But no matter how you try, you would never succeed exactly because of this. And uh, the fact that you are caught in this process of cosmogony, the universe being created together with you in the moment, where you can make an analog of spinning black holes and observe it and think about quantum mechanics and uh, some of the mathematics, yes, dividing by zero. And that's what happened uh, when black holes, when their Einstein equation of general relativity was solved by um, uh, uh, the German scientist Schwarzschild, who was dying in the Russian-German front somewhere around uh, St. Peter, between St. Petersburg and Moscow, and he wrote in 1915 a letter from the front to Albert Einstein. Um, uh, it was a few days apart from an opening of exhibition in St. Petersburg in by Petrograd. In Petrograd, time, yes. that was called zero point ten zero ten. And the interesting thing that the name of the exhibition was spelled in uh, numbers. So not as uh, letters, 10 or 0. So yes, uh, this is um, this fascinating quest, how these things can happen in parallel. The black square of Malevich, where he claimed he have reached, he. That he had reached the zero of form. And no the, the, the solution of the equation of the general re relativity they get that gave us the first model of a black hole, the Schwarzschild radius. And wh what is very interesting in the black holes and zero is this moment of singularity where not only the laws of nature break down, but our understanding of the laws of mathematics sort of breaks down. Because actually around the, uh, a black hole, uh, it, is, it is actually space time itself that is being warped, that just like around a, a liquid vortex, as in the installation, the, the actual uh, fabric uh, of, 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 the, of the cosmos is, is, is being uh, folded in upon itself. If I hear you, I have to say, I feel that, uh, well, you are the quantum physicists, you are also <laughs> the historians of science and maybe the art historians, and also if I have Florian talking, it seems that you rather feel the apprentice in this, <laughs> yeah. uh, in this interaction. So is that the case, or maybe to the two of you, what do you hope to get also f from Florian? Like, what could you help with that is still something that you need to figure out? Mm. Well, Florian's, um, uh, he is such an accomplished scientist, and if I can tell you what his lab is working on, you, you will be so impressed because he just uh, created an uh, atom laser, and he is building the most uh, precise uh, clock with, uh, that will work with the help of an atom laser. So this is a multi-million dollar pr projects of like the most pioneering research, pioneering research projects. So of course, uh, it's uh, fantastic to have such an apprentice <laughs> at our <laughs> studio. We have much to learn from our apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> but I can also learn from you about the creativity and bouncing ideas and yeah. So this there is, is nothing, Florian, you would say yes, but you didn't really, this is really something you should take into account from quantum physics because that's an interesting theoretical angle that I think you nah. missed up until now. Mm. Or what I believe in Dimitri have to take into account is precision and uh, <laughs> sometimes uh, calculate uh, before trying to do something, but <laughs> we work on this together. Yes, we're exactly <laughs> working we on it right now. We need a lot of precision for what we're working on with, with Florian and Dee. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, yeah. because then in the, end, in the end result, that was what you were fascinated by, that actually it's not about precision it's in true. this work, but, but, but in but the process sometimes you might But you have to a certain level, yeah. otherwise it just doesn't work. And I know that our, our curators also needed a lot of precision to take care of all the works here in the exhibition, so in the end, even if they don't stage that precision in the aesthetics, in the end, of course, these works need a lot of maintenance and a lot of very exact 
um, exactness in the creation. Well, they're doing a fabulous job. We have rarely seen this piece in such uh, a state after uh, several months uh, on, on display, and yeah, definitely. I big think, hats off I think to them. They really appreciate hearing that, and that's maybe also the moment to get them on stage again. But first, maybe let's see if there's questions. There's uh, oh, there's one new question just coming in. Uh, has the work has been heavily influenced by science? Do you think art and artworks like ER, ECUS, ER, EPR can also influence or inspire science in return? Well, that, that maybe Florian can <laughs> answer this. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes me think, of course, of uh, how we could do things like this in ultra-cold atom experiments, my type of experiment. So vortices, and I mean, that has been done, of course, already, but if it hadn't, it would, of course, be the inspiration. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just putting you in, in a playful mindset looking at this artwork or talking to artists and that is something you need for science too. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry we already need to wrap up here but we also don't want to make this soup too long because we know that people, especially when listening from home, uh, it's sometimes shouldn't, shouldn't get too long at least, so thanks. And um, yeah, now I invite uh, the uh, two curators of the exhibition and Raoul to me for a brief wrap up. We don't have so much time actually yes. because we promised to be done by six but probably won't fully work out but I think we can take five to ten minutes for at least some first reflections. I mean this is a work in progress I think for everybody in setting up this gallery but also this kind of conversation so we luckily don't need to come to final conclusions but do you have any like first reactions or comments on the various voices that have been voiced today? Well, frankly, I'm, I'm quite overwhelmed by all the uh, very interesting speeches that we, that, that we have heard, the, uh, the discussions between the artists and the scientists, and it brings the collaboration even more alive than, already, than it already was in the, in the um, exhibition. So, yeah, that's actually... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, maybe before we move to the others, of course, yeah. there's also space for uh, both the on-site audience and the online audience to ask uh, questions now. So if anybody of you has a question, there's a mic here and anybody online, um, you can still type in the chat. Uh, but while you do so, we can also hear from uh, Raul and Maria. Please. Ladies first? Okay. <laughs> now it's really good actually to uh, have this kind of discussion because as we uh, sometimes mention during this process, uh, the uh, voices of the artists um, were missing into this, this movies and it has been great to have uh, the artists here. Uh, okay, it's a pity because Jennifer couldn't make it, but it was great to have also the artists here because it's important in this dialogue between art and science uh, that, that really you have uh, both parts uh, dialoguing uh, with uh, one another and also uh, because yes, uh, it's something uh, which is still a work in progress, of course, but it's uh, also super exciting to have um, this space in which it is really possible to experiment it with um, this art science that is really uh, timely at the moment. There are a lot of uh, exhibitions and initiatives that are really focusing on, on this art science. Uh, so it's really great to, to have this, um, this gallery here at the FU actually because it's also something that uh, can encourage the collaboration of students, of researchers mm -hmm. and could be also this, by, uh, this space of growth uh, and that can really uh, bring something uh, unique to the university also for students to experiment and not only with curating but also to propose uh, maybe I don't know uh, research that can combine uh, both uh, fields yeah thank you Raul? yeah I completely concur with what <laughs> Maria said it's uh, for me this uh, this uh, symposium this event this symposium was really a treat I was really enjoying myself and I hope the audience uh, as well. Um, it is really a show, don't tell. I mean, we say that it is so nice that artists and scientists work together, that there's this dialogue uh, that we learn from uh, these type of uh, creative minds. Uh, but in fact, if you just look at what we uh, heard uh, today, uh, that was for me uh, showing that. And it was really very, very interesting and very nice to hear. 
also because of your uh, moderation, of course, which I'm also very <laughs> grateful of. Yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I try to do my best, of course. But it's, uh, and I find it, I mean, it's also easy if you have interesting partners to talk with, and it was so many different voices, which also makes it interesting. I mean, I think there's many things that we could go on to discuss, but of course, there will also be other occasions. But maybe there is some reactions from anybody in the audience. Not online at this moment. Okay, so the online audience tells us, please, can we get done with this? <laughs> this yeah, has actually, already been two hours, but... Actually, yeah. I, I have one question, which I haven't yeah. uh, heard the answer uh, at yet in, in the previous conversations, but I was really curious, a uh, question to, to the artists that are here, if, if this kind of um, uh, movies, have you have ever experienced this before, that um, a scientist is actually watching your work and analyze it like this? And I was really, yeah, I would really like to know if you um, if you liked it, if you um, if it um, yeah brings you further. Um, do you want to do it again? Or so, wh how was the experience for the artist? Dimitri is getting up, so yeah. please <laughs> go to the mic. I thought it was a brilliant idea, and, and I I know who. Um, was the origin of this idea it was uh, Raoul Fraser here, who of course is a um, an accomplished biophysicist himself, and uh, in some ways, uh, Evelina and I feel as though we have uh, we have dragged him into this domain, <laughs> and uh, and as a result, he has surprised us quite quite significantly with with this um, with, with these. Video interviews, but they're, they're much more than that. I think that they, they give people uh, a clue about the, uh, the the outlandish work that that we all do. Thanks, Dimitri. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question from uh, online, and that is, uh, why do you suppose it took tens of thousands of years to invent the zero as a number? It's a question I think to all of you here, not to raise to one person specifically, but I have to think, what, Maria. What was the question? Why do you think it took tens of thousands of years to invent this number zero really as a number? I think that, that's, that's, that's that more a question to the <laughs> Zero Origin Foundation, which is one of our partners, yeah. but there's no one It was not, here, no, uh, indeed, but if, if I may attempt to respond yeah. to yeah. this question, it was not that, okay, so, the, the, the term invented, it's a bit problematic uh, as a term because it's a bit of a colonial term, let's say, so just as a first, uh, as a premise uh, to say, but it's, it really doesn't took that long because Babylonians had uh, already the placeholder for the, for the zero. Let's say that mathematically wise having the weight of being uh, recognized as a number took that long, but actually there was already uh, this, uh, the zero, both in Babylonians, in, um, in Maya's uh, society, and there were also different shapes. And it's really also nice uh, how to, um, yeah, how this uh, placeholder zero really had also different shapes according to uh, different uh, places. So it's not that it took that long to invent it, the zero, but it took that long to uh, give the zero this mathematical weight. weight. So it's, it was just not you know, a space, an empty space between uh, numbers, but also it's possible to make uh, mathematical operations with, uh, with the zero. So if this might answer the question. Otherwise, we have this fantastic zero project and they are doing, <laughs> for the audience online and, and offline, they are doing this amazing conference cum workshop on zero, which has been held parallelly to the exhibition actually, and they are really uh, going deep into the history of zero and also, of course, all the aspects related to this migration, let's say, of the, of the zero. So I invite you to check also the program online of the conference cum workshop. Yeah. I hope uh, the question was answered this way. And I think that the really good thing that this question shows is uh, that the exhibition got people interested not only in art science collaboration, but also in the topic of the exhibition itself. And that's, of course, something very important to keep in mind that these collaborations are not done just for the sake of collaborating, but because there are really interesting topics to engage with mm -hmm. from 
uh, in these interactions, in these collaborations in between artists, academics, scientists, uh, and, and a broader audience. So I think that this is why I really like uh, this question as a final question, mm -hmm. because it goes back to the, to the topic that you have chosen for this first exhibition in this space. So maybe we can take this to round off, and I yeah. give you the word to yeah, I, I, uh, some closing words. Yeah, for this first uh, hybrid uh, uh, art science event, uh, I think uh, it went very <laughs> well. It was, uh, 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 I think, very interesting. We had uh, uh, nice stories from everyone, and I would uh, um, thank you all so much for participating in this. Uh, the scientists, the artists, uh, Raoul from the Art Science Lab, uh, Maria, my uh, um, uh, steun and I don't know the, <laughs> the English word, but uh, <laughs> you were amazing uh, in, uh, in uh, co-curating this exhibition and also organizing this event. And Katja, thank you so much for moderating. Sam and all the technical guys behind there somewhere, thank you very much. Um, and um, let's uh, have more of these events, I would say. Thank you, everybody.